then meld of 11 and uh, I'll be great to A. Endoscopy had showed small esophageal varices. When we did imaging, we found that he had two tumors in the right lobe. The CT scan showed 6.3 into 4.5 centimeter lyrite 5 uh, in segment uh, 7 and a 1.3 centimeter lesion in segment 8. So two lesions. He had enlarged gastrohepatic nodes with portal hypertension, but no ascites. So basically, a serotic patient with two HCCs, PET scan not showing uh, any metabolic activity anywhere else, but a metabolically active liver lesions. KFP was 12 and DCP 101. So looking at his tumor status, it was out of seven. If you combine the uh, largest tumor size with the uh, number of uh, two lesions. So he was not uh, suitable for local regional therapy. He was not willing for an upfront living donor liver transplant and was listed for a cadaveric transplant. So looking at our options while we were waiting for a cadaver transplant, what should be the choice of systemic therapy with the uh, background that he is listed for a cadaver transplant? Should we go ahead with Atizobeva, which is the uh, standard of uh, care for systemic therapy in this uh, patient? Should we consider Lenvartinib? Or is there any role of uh, Sorafenib? So I would like any of you to uh, take up. Uh, Sayyad, would you like to start off and then uh, ask the rest of the people to give their comments also? Right. So <clears throat> just a couple of points for clarification, uh, Samir. Are, were both lesions led at 5? You said one yes. was... Led, so both lesions led both at 5, right? Led, yes. Okay. Uh, what was the role of a PET scan if both were led at 5 lesions? Uh, were you uh, worried about metastases or was it something else? So both, when we are contemplating therapy, we would like to look at uh, metastases. If you are thinking of a curative therapy like liver transplant and the PET does uh, give indication... Of if it is a metabolically active uh, lesion, then it gives us an indirect uh, sort of indication of these uh, behavior, the biological uh, sort of behavior of the tumor. These were the two reasons. Right. Do you think that the PET has a, a similar sensitivity and specificity for HCC metastases as compared to other tumors? Or is it different? So as far as the diagnosis of HCC is concerned, we wouldn't look at uh, PET, we would uh, look at the MR in a cirrhotic liver. However, when we are talking about uh, deciding curative therapy, then we would want PET to uh, look at whether we can see any metastatic lesion. So PET would be the uh, okay. sort of uh, imaging in that situation for sure. Right. Professor, so coming to... can I ask yes. one question? Yes, yes please. Uh, yes. Actually, alpha-fetoprotein is not so hard. Then, uh, do you think that uh, gallium uh, PET scan is suitable uh, to distinguish some, uh, you know, uh, neuroendocrine tumors? So you are uh, wondering whether the diagnosis of HCC should be uh, sort of uh, having a differential of neuroendocrine tumor? Yes. I think the imaging was quite characteristic and we didn't have the uh, differential in mind. Our radiologists were quite uh, confident of it being a hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay. Well, uh, may I, may I um, ask a few questions? Uh, uh, what is the etiology of the uh, uh, liver diseases, so the cirrhosis, as you mentioned, in this patient? So, I have is... what the uh, suspected uh, etiology of the Cirrhosis of liver. Hep B. Hepatitis no. B. Uh, what? Fatty liver disease. Fatty liver disease. MASL. Okay. All right. Yeah, because I, I really concur with uh, Dr. Mishi so on his comments. So your alpha fetoprotein is only 12. Uh, I understand the CT scan is uh, very suggestive uh, of uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. But then uh, we simply do not have enough, uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, we don't have enough confidence that it is really hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, and uh, especially you don't have a histology. 
or if you have a PET scan, you can do a C11 acetate. In our region, they will do this to see whether this is a classical uh, pickup uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma before we proceed. Uh, this is my first comment. And the second comment is um, the liver function is uh, not uh, uh, too satisfactory with INR 1.4. And you also have uh, suggestions of small viruses. Uh, this is worrying if you want to give uh, a teaso beaver, especially the, the avastin. Um, in our regions uh, and globally, the first line therapy of stripe has been registered. I'm not sure in your part of the, uh, in, in your in your country, but uh, in the US, Europe and Japan, and also the, in the most of the Asia Pacific regions, uh, we now have a dual immune check on inhibitors uh, as uh, first line therapy in addition to the to the, the three options uh, you have mentioned. So uh, it's still come back to square one, if uh, whether we are going to uh, reduce the size of the tumor so that uh, it will be resectable or uh, uh, to have a liver transplantation, that would be ideal. But before we go ahead, uh, we need to know uh, be sure that it is uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and there is no spreading beyond uh, the liver. And if, if, even if there is spreading beyond the liver, uh, sometimes we can uh, induce complete remissions. And I have patients uh, who uh, have uh, dual immune checkpoint inhibitor with strike therapy uh, with CR and, and, and then to have liver transplantations. So that's my comment. So is there a difference in choice, uh, George? If you are considering a cadaver transplant, the choice of uh, systemic therapy, would you be considering uh, lenvatinib because of issues of uh, post-transplant rejection related to the immunotherapy? Well, uh, the, uh, the data on this area is, is, is very limited, as you know. Uh, most is based on the atezo beaver with, uh, with the uh, um, immune checkpoint inhibitors of BD1 being involved. Uh, but in our uh, uh, real-world data, so we do have patients who receive strike therapy and who goes into complete remissions, and we do have liver transplantations conducted uh, in two of our patients uh, eight weeks after uh, CR. So the patients so far so good. So I think that uh, there are lots of uh, um, um, knowledge that we need to build up to, to benefit the patients. But I still, uh, but in your case, I think that uh, the 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 most important issues is uh, whether this is really uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or whether you would uh, be able to do a liver biopsy uh, on these patients uh, to confirm the, the the histology of these patients. Sure. So we were not, uh, sort of our uh, imaging was uh, quite convincing. So we did not go ahead with uh, any other uh, differential. To go on with the uh, case, we started him on uh, lenvatinib with his uh, weight uh, base 12 milligrams. Or uh, This was last year on 23rd of August. Initially, he had a good response for the first three months. Later on, he developed uh, anorexia, oral ulcers, and the dose was reduced to 8 milligrams. However, uh, he was not compliant because of uh, side effects. So initially, uh, there was a response, but then he became irregular. And then uh, we had to uh, sort of uh, consider stopping uh, Lenvartinib. This is uh, this year in April 2023. So we had started in August 2022. Mm -hmm. He had continued lenvatinib initially regularly and then uh, irregularly because of the uh, side effects with reduced dose. So when we repeated the MRI in April 2023, the hepatic uh, lesions were uh, still viable and there were two new Lyrad 5 uh, lesions which were noted with enlarged uh, lymph nodes and a bland portal vein thrombus. So here... With the initial success, uh, full uh, lenvatinib therapy, now there are new lesions. Should The question was, should we be considering stopping lenvatinib and now consider Edizos uh, Beva? Uh, Professor Lewis, would you like to uh, come in uh, as far as the choice of uh, therapy to begin with and at this stage? 
Has Dr. Lewis joined in? Yes, yes, he has. <clears throat> Sorry, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes we can. <clears throat> Great, Th thank you. Um, I think the questions that um, we would have in a patient that we are considering for liver transplantation might relate to the use of the immune checkpoint inhibitor. And I don't know whether you have a standard practice um, related to that. You know, there are some who are concerned about um, possible rejection. And there's been discussion about that is possible rejection upon receiving a liver transplant. And so there's been discussion about how long we need to wait. Is there an appropriate wait time between when a person would have received immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy and the anticipated time at which they would receive a liver transplant um, be re and be going on immunosuppression? So I don't know if you've had much of a discussion. So we have uh, initiated a prospective uh, study a multi-center study in our country with the Liver Transplant Society of India, looking at exactly this uh, point that uh, patients who have advanced HCC and downstage with systemic therapy mm -hmm. and undergoing liver transplant, we are going to prospectively follow up and look at this specific issue. So coming back to the same point, would you have considered lenvatinib instead of Atizos, uh, beva in this situation if transplant uh, is an option? I think so. I, I think I would have con I would consider at least a non-immune checkpoint option, um, and at, at least um, determine whether the person would um, respond. Because we are, we have a view to transplant, we to some degree our goal is to um, halt progression of the disease. Um, we don't necessarily need to achieve long term. Um, sustained um, remission of the dis disease, which would be the great benefit of the immune checkpoint option. What about uh, delisting uh, from the cadaver list if you are seeing new lymph nodes, which are uh, coming up? So George mentioned something about uh, a complete response, uh, even with uh, lymph nodes. So should we be uh, remotely considering transplantation in patients who have had a complete response with lymph nodes responding to immunotherapy? George, you are... Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, that's another question because uh, you, you are seeing the multiple enlarged uh, uh, lymphadenopathy and enlarging. Uh, this is worrying. Uh, I, I personally, uh, well, as, as uh, uh, Bob mentioned, so we do have limited data on these areas of how aggressive we can be, but uh, with these uh, lymph nodes, uh, I, I, I would be worried to put uh, patients on, uh, on the transplant list, uh, even uh, if the, the primary lesions shrink, uh, because uh, this could represent uh, a disease by itself. And you don't have a PET scan, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, brought up by the Domeshi and Sid, uh, if we can have PET scans to see how active the lesions might be, we will be in a much better position to make a decision. So we did have a PET scan at this stage and the lymph nodes were metabolically active. So we did mm. delift him uh, from the cadaver transplant and we considered that is a at this stage. So to go on, uh, in when we are considering it is a before initiating immunotherapy, uh, uh, Professor Lewis, I would like you to sort of uh, uh, take us through. We normally would do endoscopy, and if there are grade two esophageal varices without red colored uh, signs, would you accept that? Or if there are large varices larger than uh, grade two, would you ban them? Would you be worried if there is portal vein thrombosis? Like in this situation, there was a bland portal vein thrombus. Would you be worried about the portal hypertension? because of the portal vein thrombosis and uh, varices, and would it change your dosage of bevacizumab uh, when you are giving atizobeva? Professor Lewis? Yeah, so I, I think 
we would ban in anything that's more than small varices, less than five uh, millimeters in size, we would ban um, um, with the view of banding to completion um, before um, atezabev therapy. If the patient has portal vein thrombosis, I think we would still, you know, a lot depends on the functional degree of thrombosis. And so we would still band and observe. Sometimes you band the varices, uh, become deflated and scarred down, but there are patients for whom you band, you come back, there's still varices, you band, you come back, there's still varices. I think I would be very concerned in that circumstance where it, it would seem that the portal vein thrombosis is more functionally severe. Would you start off with the lower dose of bevacizumab in patients who have portal vein thrombosis? We, I, I don't believe my medical oncology colleagues are doing that. I think that for them, the decision really is, are we able to ban to completion? And if, if we are, then they would go with full dose bevacizumab. Okay. Um, if there's a question mm -hmm. about giving bevacizumab at all, they would likely use a different option. Um, and and um, Professor Sari, would they you would be want using to make the stride comment? option. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, thank you, uh, Robert, for joining, firstly, and part of it. An amazing case. Two points. First, if the patient has metabolically active on PET scan, uh, we would do a EUS biopsy because many a times we found tuberculosis as the cause rather than just so I would not delist I would do EUS guided biopsy number two uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Lewis that we should ban but I would first start beta blockers especially if the patient has a splenic stiffness which is above 50 uh, or liver stiffness is above 25 uh, after beta blocker therapy, uh, after two weeks or so, I would uh, take up for bending. But bending without beta blockers may harm sometimes the patient might bleed. But this is my approach. Uh, this is what I do. Okay, thanks. So would you wait for the bending uh, result like how no. Professor Lewis said or would you start off? I think that is the key if question. If I achieve the heart rate, to target uh, every day we increase the carbidilol in five days if i achieve a target heart rate of maybe 60 or so i would be happy i would think it is a possibility but yes in patients with pbt sometimes both the lsm and ssm may be fallacious so in those cases i think beta blockers plus evl should be considered if there are large viruses because bevacizumab can it, it doesn't precipitate, but the ulcers of EVL uh, are not healing and they can bleed. So in those patients where PVT is there, the EVL can be risky and bevacizumab cannot be given in my opinion. But if you haven't done EVL, beta blockers with PVT should be okay. okay. So as far as the lab investigations uh, were concerned, the hemoglobin was 12.9, WBC 4,400, platelets 88, creatinine 0.96. Billy had gone up to 4.9. Enzymes were reasonable. Albumin was 2.5, INR 1.37. Uh, BCP had gone up, so it was 1,790 with the uh, tumor progression. But alpha fetoprotein was uh, normal. So I think a comment uh, to what George Lau said, we have found only in 40% of our patients AFP elevated and uh, DCP PIVCA uh, does guide us uh, uh, as far as monitoring is concerned in these uh, group of patients. CTP was B9, male 16 and I'll be grade 3. So again, a question is, do we have a cutoff where we do not consider immunotherapy in patients who have uh, child pux says B but closer to the CB9 and not actually decompensated with C. Any thoughts on when not to start immunotherapy because of the liver status? B7, B8, B9, does it make a difference? Professor Lewis? 
I, I think this is another of the questions that is at yet completely is at yet unanswered. My sense is that our colleagues in medical oncology would typically be very comfortable treating up to B7. Um, B8 and B9 are, appear to be functionally different from B7 um, in many cases, and so they would be quite cautious about treating the more the, the more se um, severe um, cirrhosis or more advanced cirrhosis. And child C, would you ever consider, or you would not consider at all? No. I think at this point not, but again, <laughs> I think this is where. Post um, launch of the products, you know, we begin to get real world evidence, and I think if we were able to get real world, world evidence about specific subgroups of patients that might benefit, um, I think I think that's yet to be seen. But at this point, um, my medical oncology colleagues would not. Okay. Agreed. So, so you keep on saying your medical oncology colleagues, uh, we. We bring them into our uh, discussion, but actually we don't listen to them unless the patient lands up into problems. <laughs> then we surely listen to them. <laughs> well, I, I always say that the, the core of, of the care of patients with hepatobiliary cancers is multidisciplinary. So, <laughs> so we have a meeting together and, and we, we have these discussions together so that we can we can bring all all the viewpoints into the discussion. Yeah. Samir, maybe I can just ask a quick question. Yeah, yeah. Who yeah. in India who who prescribes immunotherapy to HCC patients? The 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 hepatologists or is it is it the uh, oncologists still? So if the patient goes to oncologists, they need not involve a hepatologist. But if the patient comes to us, then we have a MDT every week where we discuss and we definitely take their uh, inputs. But I think in situations like uh, esophageal varices, they would sort of look up to us to make decisions because we have more experience in dealing with uh, varices. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so we did start uh, him on uh, Edizos Beva. He received four cycles from May of 2023 onwards to June and July. The MRI liver did show a partial response. However, after the fourth cycle of Edizobeva, he developed jaundice. So these were the uh, serial sort of uh, liver uh, function tests. The bile had remained stable around uh, three, but then it jumped up in the month of August to suddenly to 20. The enzymes didn't jump up so much, although they did go up. But they were not more than, uh, say, uh, five times uh, elevated. And uh, alkaline phosphatase gamma GT also actually did not uh, go up to suggest uh, cholangitis. INR remained more or less uh, same. So the issue was uh, we didn't see uh, any sudden progression in these uh, liver tumor, either development of a large portal vein thrombus or... Uh, involvement of the bile ducts. However, the ANA was 1 in 100 positive and the smooth muscle antibody was positive and the IgG was 2383. Now, we didn't have any baseline uh, autoantibodies. Professor Lewis, would you be regularly doing baseline autoantibodies or, or just the clinical uh, sort of uh, situation of no obvious uh, autoimmune disorders is good enough? Yes, I think for most patients for whom we have a known or a presumed known cause of the hepatocellular carcinoma, we would typically not necessarily be doing the baseline autoantibodies. Um, but it's a great question when you're considering um, giving immune checkpoint therapy um, because of the idea that you might unmask um, uh, maybe a, a, a tendency to autoimmunity uh, with the immune checkpoint. So what would you feel that the cause of deterioration is, if I go back uh, this slide again, the bilirubin had disproportionately jumped up compared to the liver enzymes and the alkaline phosphatase and gamma GT had not uh, jumped up. So it was not like a hepatitis uh, 
which was predominant, but the bilirubin was suddenly it jumped up to more than uh, five times the previous uh, one. What would you feel? The MRCP was normal. As I said, there was no gross uh, worsening of the liver uh, tumor to explain that the entire tumor uh, was involving the liver and that's why the belief was high. Would you accept this as a autoimmune hepatitis related to the immune che checkpoint inhibitors? Uh, I think I would definitely be concerned about that in this setting. Would you do a biopsy or would you give steroids? What would you use? Uh... I, would, I would probably initiate a trial of steroids to see if it, uh, it it's, it's beneficial, but of course, we would probably also first discontinue the immune checkpoint in, in, in inhibitor sure. therapy. Sure. So any other <laughs> thoughts from anybody else? Uh, yeah, Samir, I have a quick question. ANA uh, ANA of one in a hundred is really yeah. not all that dramatic, is it? Yeah. I mean, it's it's just it's just hovering above the baseline, which is one in eighty generally or whatever. Very true. And um, I am never sure about the IgG levels, what they what they mean, and at least in liver disease, so so it's all they they're all over the place. Uh, so, do you really think that this is autoimmunity induced by the by the checkpoint inhibitors, or is, is this something else? I mean, uh, yes, a trial of steroids may be fine. Stopping uh, obviously stopping the immune immune therapy would be the first step. But are you convinced about a trial of steroids here? So the way we looked at it, we had no other explanation for the mm. sudden deterioration in these mm. uh, liver enzymes and these uh, bilirubin. I would have expected the tumor, if it was uh, causing the problems, we would have seen tumor involving mm. the bile duct or tumor involving the uh, portlovane or uh, an increase in size of the tumor, which was not uh, there. An anti-smooth muscle antibody along with the IgG, which is uh, 2,000 is a significant uh, elevation. If it was around 1,500, I would have said that, okay, it's borderline. Most of the times in serotics, we would see. But 2383 and ASMA positive did uh, show. And... Uh, yeah, some... Sorry to interrupt. Yes. Yeah. This Is this ANA, ASMA is positive before or no? When yeah. he was diagnosed for this so we, had not done, uh, we had not done the uh, uh, ANA ASMA because it was a, a fatty liver disease uh, as the etiology. So the baseline so we had not done. Also... We did it when yeah, that is the additional. Yes. It's the time if of it was not the... there, new onset. Yeah, it is new, new onset, onset that may be. Yeah. yeah, it's a new onset. So okay. we did stop the uh, uh, immune therapy and started on prednisolone. However, the LFT continued to worsen and the bilirubin uh, went up uh, from 3 to 32. The enzymes were not uh, proportionately elevated as the bilirubin. Uh, the albumin dropped, the patient uh, didn't improve, continued to deteriorate, developed urinary tract infection and was admitted with uh, hepatic encephalopathy. And then ultimately he succumbed to a septic uh, shock. So this was the uh, sort of sequence of events. So initially he did tolerate the uh, Etizobeva for at least uh, four cycles. And the last, the fourth cycle, suddenly there was a deterioration which did not respond to uh, prednisolone. Professor uh, Lewis, your thoughts on uh, this? What do you feel happened? and whether we could have done anything differently. Um, difficult to know. I think, you know, it's reasonable for us to presume that there was some immune mediated event, but, you know, un unfortunately patients with progressive um, liver disease will on, on occasion decompensate. I think those questions that that would be raised about could it be that there was an, an infiltrative component to this um, tumor that was not as visible on imaging, for example, 
so that there was more there um, from the tumor perspective than was seen. Could we have had an immune component that um, that was not mm -hmm. it was not possible to reverse? Um, because by the time we had very high bilirubins, um, that would um, that would make the disease that much more um, more severe and sometimes um, difficult to reverse on, on prednisone. But it definitely raises the question about, I think, from again, coming back to our medical oncology colleagues, they're very cautious about us sending them patients when there's still sufficient functional reserve when we are going into therapy with um, the immune checkpoint and, and some of the newer therapies, because um, we often find that if, if other therapies have led to loss of, um, of hepatic reserve, we have the situation then where there is not much room for the systemic therapy um, because um, any adverse components can tip the patient into liver failure. So, so what has not been clear so far is, are the immune uh, mediated uh, hepatitis more in patients who have borderline liver dysfunction, child B7 onwards versus child A? Do they have increased incidence of immune mediated or it is same across uh, the board? Uh, Dr. Zegam here, may I say something? Yeah, yeah, go on Zegam. Uh -huh. I think there is a good paper that was published in Journal of Hepatology in June. And this is a multicenter cohort trial. And in that trial, they showed about uh, one third of the patients who received check wide inhibitors that were daily drug induced liver injury. They have the intrahepatic cholestatic pattern rather than the hepatocellular pattern. So we should not forget that uh, check wide inhibitors not only may cause autoimmune hepatitis like picture, but they may also present with the cholestatic picture as well. So this was my comment. Sure. So that. That was the question whether uh, the tolerance is better with child A versus B7 onwards. Is that the thing and whether we are sort of pushing the envelope too far and expecting uh, results and we should be more cautious when we are dealing with B7 onwards and expect more of such results was the uh, question. Mm -hmm. I think you're absolutely right. We have to be, the, the, the less, the more um, liver dysfunction there is, the more cautious it's important to be mm -hmm. and, and and the more likelihood that we will, we we may have adverse events. Yeah. But in, you know, often these patients are in a difficult situation. We, we don't feel like we have um, other choices, but I think that's where with each, each element of liver dysfunction, for example, the portal vein thrombosis in this patient is, is a negative factor as well. Yeah. And so with each element they have of, of that reflects liver dysfunction, I think we have to recognize that there's more, there's more risk and, and more likelihood of decompensation. Sure. So with this case, I wanted to create a platform where Professor uh, Luis now can take over to tell us about how to individualize uh, therapy uh, in patients who have such advanced uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, where the choices of treatment become uh, limited and we tend to push the envelope in trying to do our best to help the situation. So thank you very Dr. much, uh, all of you. Yes. Dr. Samir, I don't think Dr. Lewis needs any introduction, but uh, just for the sake of formalities, may make it, can I ask our co-moderator, uh, Dr. Hasmik, to please introduce Dr. Lewis Roberts properly. Hasmik? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Hasmik from Armenia, and I'm second uh, moderator. So uh, my pleasure to invite uh, 
second uh, speaker, um, uh, Dr. Robert Lewis, Professor, Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology, Mayo College of Medicine and Science, Rochester, USA. Very short uh, 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 CV for Professor uh, Robert, uh, external co-chair, the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, Holland Car Genome Project, National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health, Member Guidelines Development Group, uh, World Health Organization, Guidelines for Screening Care and Treatment of Persons Infected with Hepatitis B Virus, Member Outreach Committee, World Gastroenterology Organization, Member Editor of uh, Board Hepatology Journal and uh, um, Member Oversight Committee Network of Minority Health Research Investigators, uh, External Co-Chair TCGA Hepatocellular Carcinoma, Peter and Franz uh, Georgian Professor of Gastroenterology uh, Cancer, uh, Cancer Research. Mm. Please, Professor. Um, Thanks very much. I'll try to share my screen. Can you see it? Yeah, if you can just put it in the, yeah, now it's in the presentation mode. Please go ahead. Great. Well, um, thanks very much for this opportunity to um, participate in, in this session. It's a great pleasure. Uh, I have a few disclosures. And um, I, um, Professor Saren asked me if I would base this um, on the presentation that I made at the um, ASLD liver meeting um, for the um, um, Leon Schiff um, lecture. And so what I'd like to do is talk um, about the importance of identifying the population at risk in terms of cancer control. So I'll talk briefly about epidemiology and then um, focusing more on concepts relating to personalization of care. I'll talk about biomarkers, and we've already had a, a good discussion about a couple of biomarkers in, in this case, and how they can predict tumor genomics, biology, and patient outcomes. I'll talk about um, exceptional responders to serafinib and the case for tumor genomic and genetic characterization as we um, develop um, treatment plans for our patients, and then show some work about um, a clinical trial we are performing with combination treatments to improve anti-tumor immunity and tumor response. So liver cancer is the most lethal of the major cancers in I think we all recognize recognize this from the WHO um, reports that liver cancer of the major cancers, it's number six in incidence, but in mortality, it's number three or number two, depending on whether you add um, colon and rectum together. And um, when we look at the mortality ratio, we see that um, Globally, 92% of patients diagnosed with liver cancer um, will be deceased within a year of diagnosis. So the mortality ratio is very high. And the other way of looking at it is that a one-year survival globally is only 8%. So we have um, work to do to improve um, outcomes of our patients with liver cancer. If we look at liver cancer deaths globally, we can see that most of the deaths are in Asia, Pacific, and in Sub-Saharan Africa. But I think it's important to note that in North America, for example, in the United States, we have intermediate incidents and, and deaths across the um, United States, but we actually have individual states that if they were a country by themselves, would be a high incidence country for, for hepatocellular carcinoma. So in the United States, hepatocellular carcinoma is actually one of the few cancers for which we are seeing increasing incidence and mortality over time. So the importance of epidemiology is really from a, a clinical perspective, I, recognizing that identifying those at risk is key to improving cancer control. And if we think about the, uh, the molecular epidemiology of liver cancer, in terms of liver cancer, 
etiologies, we recognize, of course, that the viruses, chronic viral hepatitis, hepatitis B and C, are major etiologies of liver cancer. And so in, in some circumstances, viral genetics may be important. And we think of this particularly with the genetics of hepatitis B, where different genotypes are associated with different risk in different parts of the world. That actually brings in the host genetics component because it's clear that for hepatitis B that there's a strong interaction between viral genetics and host genetics. And viruses can be more active and um, pathogenic in some host populations than they are in other host populations. On the other hand, if we look at lifestyle, we, we know that obesity, alcohol, and diabetes associated with metabolic associated um, liver disease. And that is a major and increasing contributor to liver cancer globally. And then we also have environmental factors. Um, we've known about aflatoxin for a long time. We recognized aristolochic acid, um, which is a compound from Chinese wild ginger to be um, a, a toxin that's quite um, mutagenic. Um, in um, patients in Asia. And more recently, it's been shown in, in individuals with HCC from Mongolia that dimethyl sulfates um, from the use of coal in heating homes in Mongolia is likely a coal carcinogen as well. So we recognize that treating the risk factors reduces liver cancer rates. And I'd like you to focus on the lowest row, which is the idea that having more than one risk factor multiplies our risk of cancer. And so that there's often synergism between the different etiologies. So this of course occurs in the cases of viral hepatitis with for example, toxin exposure after toxin exposure or alcohol exposure for, for that um, um, also. And um, increasingly, we see patients with alcohol and um, um, steatotic liver disease or obesity and um, related um, steatotic liver disease. And so it's important to recognize the synergism because the other side of synergism is that if we can reduce any one risk factor, we can substantially reduce the risk of cancer. And I think that's um, often what our goal is in, in, in addressing cancer risk. And this is just data showing that in the case of hepatitis C, there's early data showing that achieving sustained biological response is associated with substantially reduced rates of um, hepatocellular carcinoma. So risk reduction and early detection are key for liver cancer control. I think we all here understand that surveillance for liver cancer results in diagnosis of earlier stage disease and treating early stage liver cancer is much more effective and less expensive than treating late stage liver cancer. And so in terms of our cascade of care to control liver cancer, we want to prevent the causes. Um, beyond that, we want to identify within the population individuals who are at risk so that they can be enrolled in surveillance programs so we can ideally detect their cancer early and treat it effectively. Um, and for those um, who we are detecting cancer later, we want to be able to determine uh, or to develop treatments that are most effective at every stage. And so we already, for patients with early stage disease, actually personalize their treatment depending on the location of the, of, of, of the tumor, depending on the underlying liver disease, we are personalizing the use of different treatment modalities. And I think thinking in terms of systemic therapy, we want to expand that. We want to be able to understand the different subtypes of cancer and ideally identify treatments that are most effective for the different subtypes. So I'd like here to talk about the impact of not uh, the overall cancer control cascade and the impact of not identifying those at risk within a particular population. And here I, I have these three rows and, and I characterize them. I, I characterize row one as being um, typical of a country such as Japan. In Japan, we, we know that um, there's screening of basically all adults 
So almost everyone that's at risk for liver cancer in, in Japan is identified. I say here 0 0.9, 90% of individuals at risk are identified. So if early detection allows us to detect patients at early stages, about 70% of, indiv of individuals at early or very early stages, and we have effective treatment that in this case we're estimating, I'm estimating is 80% effective, then we achieve a measure of cancer control of um, about 50%. And actually that's about what we see in Japan for five-year survival of patients with liver cancer. On the other hand, the second row I would characterize as the United States. We estimate that we only know about a third, about 30% of those individuals who are at risk. Even if we have equivalent early detection and treatment modalities to, to Japan, with only 30% of individuals at, at risk being identified and under surveillance, the maximum control that we can achieve is about a 17%. And indeed, we have somewhere between 15 and 20% five-year survival in the United States. And then the third row, I characterize as um, being in, from sub-Saharan Africa, for example, my or, uh, home country of Ghana. We only have identified perhaps 5% of those individuals who are at risk, even if we're able to achieve 70% early detection and 80% effective treatment, our cancer control rates would be really poor and we would be seeing only about 3% five-year survival. And in actual fact, we probably achieve less than that. So just to highlight the impact, the, 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 of the importance of this issue of identifying those at risk, if we look at the last three rows here, I have kept the, ad, um, the proportion at risk that's identified at 0.3, so which is uh, about 30%, which is what we have in the United States. And just to make the point that if we were to increase early detection to 95%, and even to e increase effectiveness of treatment to 95%, so we are doing perfectly on early detection and in treatment. The maximum we uh, benefit we would get and is still limited, and we would be seeing only about you know twenty five to thirty percent um, cancer control. So or five year survival. So near perfect early detection and effectiveness of treatment cannot make up for not identifying those at risk. Okay. So it's important for us to rem remember that tumor heterogeneity drives the need for personalized diagnosis and treatment. And we all recognize that uh, the tumor, tumor phenotype often reflects tumor biology in HCC. And here's an example. On the right side, we have someone that was diagnosed with HCC under surveillance. And you can see a two to three centimeter tumor, limited in size, single, much more easily treatable. Then in the middle, we have a patient who was diagnosed um, when they presented with symptoms. This person had a single lesion, um, large lesion, uh, but the different biology than the third person on the left who has an infiltrative type tumor with multiple, multiple nodules. And these phenotypes that we see radiologically clearly reflect differences in underlying tumor biology. And um, what I'd like to do in, in the rest of the talk is talk about three different projects that we have done that each um, have um, um, are related to personalization and optimizing personalization of, of care for patients with liver cancer. And then the first project is one that um, shows that biomarkers reflect tumor biology and can predict patient outcomes. And this is work that was done by Dr. Kion Su An from Daegu in, in Korea uh, when he was visiting us a few years back. And we looked at associations of the serum tumor biomarkers with integrated genomic and clinical characteristics of HCCs. And so what we did was we had done this large um, project, the Cancer Genome Atlas, that was funded by the National Cancer Institute and the National Human Genome Research Institute here in the United States. And we had assembled um, HCCs from patients who had received resections actually throughout um, North America. We had sites in Europe and then we had sites in Asia as well that contributed um, samples to this project. And of the 
approximately 400 samples that we received, we had um, serum samples available for about um, 90 of these um, patients. And so we performed um, testing for the AFP, AFP, L3, and DCP. And then, of course, we had very extensive genomic characterization of these tumors. So interestingly, of the 91 patients that we were able to profile, 26 of them were normal for all three markers. Um, we found this so substantial overlap between AFP and AFP L3. And you can see that um, approximately 26 of, the, of, of those patients had elevations of either AFP or AFP L3. 21 patients had elevation of all three biomarkers, AFP, AFP L3, and DCP. And then 13 patients had elevations of DCP alone. Now, when we looked at overall survival of these patients, so these were all patients with early stage who had surgical resection performed. And these patients, uh, we see uh, of those who had normal levels of all three biomarkers, achieved a remarkable 10-year survival of 100%. Those individuals who had elevations of all three biomarkers, the 21 individuals with elevations of all three biomarkers, we saw a median survival. They had substantially worse outcomes despite going for curative intent resection, a median survival of perhaps about 33 months. And then for those who had either elevations of AFP and AFP and AFPL3 and or AFPL3 or elevations of DCP alone, their outcomes were actually quite good, but intermediate between those two, so that we saw a median survival or a five-year survival of around um, just above 80%, between 80 and 90%. So again, biomarkers reflecting tumor biology, and we went on to look at the genomics of these tumors, and we could see specific changes in the tumor genomics associated with the biomarkers. So we had genes that were upregulated only in individuals with elevated AFP or AFPL3 or DCP, and similarly downregulated genes that were also um, associated with the different biomarkers. And looking then at this data, we were able to use um, these biomarkers to determine which pathways were associated, were upregulated or downregulated associated with the different biomarkers. And so I think this is work that, of course, is, is similar to much of the, of the, of the rest of, of work that's going on currently in this area of personalized um, prediction. It's trying to understand um, what, um, bio, what markers or what um, the genomics is that's associated with particular tumors and if we can personalize therapies um, so that we are targeting the therapies that um, would be most effective in individual patients. So blood-based biomarkers can predict the outcome of patients after surgery in this case. We are already using these biomarkers clinically as for example, our liver transplant guidelines now typically exclude patients with markedly elevated AFP due to the high risk of post-transplant recurrence. Um, biomarkers can be associated with activation of specific oncogenic pathways and the biomarkers can potentially predict response to specific therapies. So the next point that I wanted to make is that the goal of all personalized treatments is to normalize exceptional responses. So I say all of my patients want to have exceptional response. They don't want to be a patient that had average response. And I think that's the case really for all of our patients with HTC for each specific therapy they receive. And so our goal really is for each specific therapy is to try to optimize the response of patients. And, and the example I want to use here is, is a work that was initially done by Professor, Professor Kudo and his colleagues, um, the first author being Dr. Arau, in which they showed that amplification of the FGF3, FGF4, FGF19 locus, which is on chromosome 11, is, uh, was associated with multiple lung metastasis in patients who were receiving, um, um, in patients with HCC, but also associated with 
exceptional respond, response to some uh, of some patients to sorafenib. And so this um, was published in Hepatology in 2013. And um, this, these are slides um, that uh, Professor Kudo provided where he shows that, um, for example, in these patients where fish, and you can see this patient, fish shows these red dots are the areas of amplification of um, FGF3 within the tumor cells and nuclei. And you can see that these nuclei have many, many, many dots of, of red. And so this patient has FGF3 amplification compared to a control that has negative fish. And in this example patient, you can see a large um, tumor and the response to sorafenib, um, um, substantial response um, with loss of enhancement. And so we went back to the Cancer Genome Atlas and we had in, in this case, 440 hepatella carcinomas and looked at the uh, locus of for FGF3, FGF4, FGF19. And we found that 4% of the 440 HCCs that we looked at had amplification of this locus. And you can see here FGF19, three and four were co-amplified in approximately 4% of these tumors. And my colleague, Dr. Hind Hassan, then um, looked at a more recent cohort of individuals. We of course, fortunately could not use the cohort um, that we had used for TCGA, of course, because um, that cohort was, was patients who received resection. We did not have the clinical information on who had subsequently received serafinib. So we took a cohort of 260 Mayo Clinic patients and um, that were diagnosed between 2012 and 2018. Um, they had received curative surgical treatment or liver biopsies, and we sent these for mRNA sequencing and targeted mutational and copy number analysis at, a t at Tempus Labs, which is one of the commercial companies here in the United States, and then did a statistical analysis to assess the impact of FGF locus amplification on patient response and outcomes. And of course, after resection, some of these patients would have had subsequent progression and recurrence, and some of them would have been treated with serafinib. And so we had the information of who had been on serafinib subsequently. And it turned out that 18 of the 260 patients, so about 7%, had amplification at this FGF3419 locus on chromosome 11. And in the course of treatment, four out of the 18 had been treated with serafinib. And when we looked at, this is one of those patients, and we, when we looked at um, the different FGF um, pathway genes, you, could, you can see here that on chromosome 11, the FGF1943 locus was amplified with five copies of um, this locus in, in this patient. And um, this is a patient who then um, I, I had seen, um, had been referred to me, she had had a surgical resection and then subsequently had developed a splenic metastasis. At the time I saw her, she had an AFP of almost 60,000. And um, we started her on sorafenib. Within two months, her AFP had declined to 10. And you can see here that there was substantial shrinkage and loss of enhancements of um, the splenic metastasis by four months after her AFP had decreased to 3.3. And this patient um, ended up actually living approximately five years on sorafenib um, um, treatment for her HCC. And unfortunately, when she passed away, it was actually from an accident. She broke her hip and not from progression of her liver disease. So she had an exceptional response to sorafenib. So coming back to a group of 260 patients, we identified those individuals who at some point in their therapy had received serafinib and, and looked to see whether they or not they had FGF locus amplification. And then looking at their outcomes, you can see here that those individuals who had amplification had substantially better outcomes than the individuals who did not have FGF locus amplification. Indeed, those with amplification had a median survival of almost five years. Those without amplification had a median survival of less than a year. And this was after, st uh, after starting serafinib. So it's possible to identify biomarkers of exceptional response to systemic multikinase inhibitor therapy, in this case, serafinib. 
And, and we see that the FGF3419 locus amplification occurs in depending on the cohort between two and 7% of HCCs. Now, someone would say, and, and when Professor Kuro and his colleagues actually published their paper originally, they had observed this amplification in about 2% of their initial cohort. And they said, boy, you know, we wonder whether, you know, there's, there's sufficient numbers of patients with HCCs that we can um, actually justify screening for this amplification and treating patients based on their presence of this amplification. Now, one of my colleagues, um, Professor Alex Ajay at Cleveland Clinic, treats patients with lung cancer. And what I see in lung cancer is that, you know, they use ALK inhibitors to treat patients who have these ALK kinase fusions. Now, ALK fusions occur in 4 to 5% of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. But Professor Ajay screens all of his patients with non-small cell lung cancer to find that 4 to 5%. And ALK inhibitors are, are FDA approved for the treatment of that small fraction of non-small cell lung cancer patients. Similarly, the US FDA has approved NTREC inhibitors for patients with solid tumors who have NTREC fusions. Now, if we look across all solid tumors, only 03 to 0.4% of all solid tumors have NTREC fusions. So the FDA has approved treatment and uh, many, in, many um, 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 oncologists now are screening all individuals with um, the solid tumors that they're seeing, looking for these NTREC fusions so that they can treat patients with them. And so the question that I think that raises is, is there now good rationale for us as hepatologists and oncologists taking care of patients with HCC to biopsy and perform the genomics of um, and, and, um, and copy number um, alterations in HCCs, particularly in patients with metastases, for locus amplification at, at, at the FGS3419 locus in order to take advantage of the potential for exceptional response. So in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about a third idea in terms of, of, of personalizing therapy. And that is the idea that we might be able to maximize the benefit of immune-based based therapies by adding combinations of therapies that um, affect the immune cycle in tumors at different locations. And this is work um, that um, we started as a pilot study of intratumoral injection of autologous dendritic cells after high-dose conformal external beam radiotherapy in patients with unresectable liver cancer. And um, these are the colleagues that um, collaborated in, the, um, in this study, Dr. Judong Yang, who's at, um, now at Cedar sinai um, in, um, in LA, Dr. Lionel Kanko from Kauai is my colleague, medical oncologist, Dr. Sean Park, radiation oncologist, Dr. Elena, hematologist, who is um, an expert on cell therapies, and Dr. Alan Dietz, who runs the cell therapy laboratory at Mayo Clinic. So the problem that we have is immunotherapy is transforming the lives of those cancer patients who respond um, but despite our success in this area, most patients with liver cancer do not respond to either single agent or even double agent immune checkpoint inhibition. And we find that people have these immunologically cold tumors that have a low number of effective, effector T cells in the tumor microenvironment. And so why do we want to use combinations? We want to try to improve the response rates to single agent um, checkpoint inhibitors that typically average only 10 to 30%. We want to convert non-responders to responders and overcome primary response and um, primary resistance to immune checkpoint inhibition. We want to res rescue patients who have progressed on immunotherapy, overcome secondary resistance and also deepen the responses that do occur so that we can increase the survival benefits. And our hope is that this will allow us to harness tumor biology to support immunotherapy, but using additional monoclonal antibodies, small molecular inhibitors, or other therapies, and also integrate with historical treatment modalities such as chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And so if we think about the cancer immunity um, cycle you know, we start cancer immunity starts with release of tumor antigens. 
we have these tumor antigens exposed to cancer antigen um, presenting cells such as dendritic cells. Those prime and activate um, um, T cells, and these T cells will traffic back to tumors, infiltrate into the tumors, recognize the cancer cells, and kill the cancer cells. And so um, our current therapies are targeting this cycle. You know, we have um, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, targeted therapy, improving the release of tumor antigens, vaccines that improve uh, antigen presentation, and then um, immune checkpoints that affect the primary and activation of T cells. And then we have, um, sorry, um, we have um, anti-VEGF, for example, um, improving infiltration of T cells into tumors. We have CARs, um, um, CAR T cells that improve recognition of cancer cells by T cells. And then um, we also have killing of cancer cells in PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition, IDO inhibition that enhance killing of these cells. And so what we are trying to do with radiotherapy is really um, boost um, the, the more immunogenic forms of cell death. And so cancer cells avoid immune stimulation by dying in ways that avoid detection by the immune, immune system. So we say they have non-immunogenic cell death modes. And we're trying to induce immune-based therapies um, by uh, boost immune-based therapies by inducing more immunogenic forms of cell death and one of the ways of doing this is with radiation therapy that has been shown to upregulate expression of genes that contain immunogenic mutations and can synergize with new antigen vaccination to improve, to improve tumor control. And so dendritic cell therapy is, um, is promoted uh, because dendritic cells are the center of the immunological universe. They sample the environment, they sense pathogens and abnormal um, um, uh, antigens. They traffic from the periphery to lymph nodes, present the antigens, shape their adaptive immune response, and can also inhibit unwanted responses and activate needed responses in the immune system. And so this protocol that we developed involves um, radiation therapy to liver tumors. But before we actually initiate uh, the radiation therapy, we we, we um, isolate, autolog and, and purify, and um, amplify, and mature autologous dendritic cells. And so we inject these dendritic cells into the milieu of the irradiated tumor, um, which causes education of the tumor uh, of the um, of the dendritic cells and activation of the dendritic cells. They can traffic to the lymph nodes, educate cells within the lymph nodes, and then these cells can traffic back to the tumor and increase tumor cell killing. And so for this um, protocol, first we do apheresis, um, where we um, isolate um, the, um, the, the monocytes, mature them um, to dendritic cells, and then um, while this process is ongoing, the patients receive external beam radiation therapy. And so cycle one is this, and then um, and, and the, the patients are receiving radiation therapy. After radiation therapy, they go through cycles two to four where they get multi monthly intratumoral dendritic cell injections with about 60 million cells of dendritic cells. For the first two cycles, we also give injections of Prevna pneumococcal vaccination as an adjuvant therapy. And then in the remaining cycles, they get monthly intrapural injections up to um, a total of seven um, injections. And they go in then into an observational event monitoring phase. And we started out with a pilot study in which we treated five patients with HTC3 with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. The maximal dose of 60 million dead radiation cells appeared to be well tolerated without autoimmunity or grade three or higher adverse events. And once um, we had had the patients, a number of patients complete the protocol, we found objective response rates of about 60%. And so we moved forward um, with um, expanding this protocol. And this just to show you one example, or a couple of examples of patients on this protocol. This is a patient with unresectable intrahepatic laryngocarcinoma who was treated, treated with radiation and intratumoral mm -hmm. autologous dendritic cells. And you can see 
the response, this is post-radiation treatment at month one. By month four, you can see the shrinking uh, of the tumor beginning by month 36. Um, this patient had had um, almost complete um, response where I was ongoing at 36 months. This is another patient um, who had unresectable HTC, again treated this month one post um, 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 external beam therapy, and then month nine post DC, you can see loss of enhancement of the tumor as well. And so um, what we are doing now is, uh, and we can do um, um, additional studies to better understand really how the immune system is being shaped by this process of the radiation therapy and autologous dendritic cell injection, what's happening to different types of, um, of CD4 and CD8 cells, for example. Now we recognize that we have atezobev um, that um, is, um, is creating um, responses in up to maybe 30% <laughs> of our patients. And our question um, in this next phase, uh, phase two of this study has been, what if we add atezobev to the um, protocol that I've just shown you since um, the protocol seemed quite safe. And, um, and that's what um, we um, are doing currently. We start, we've started a phase two in the HCC cohort, adding atezobev to um, this combination of radiation therapy and dendritic cell injection. So just to make the point that we are trying to attack again, this immunity cycle in cancer through multiple additional um, sites uh, in hope that we can, again, further boost the um, response to immune-based therapies. And I think I'll stop um, here and, and see if there's questions. This just uh, describes the new protocol with the addition uh, of atezolizumab and bevacizumab. And um, just a key take here that combined external beam radiation, um, Prevna immune adjuvant and intrapsumal dendritic cell injection is well tolerated <laughs> in trepatic laryngocostoma and HCC. We have moved to a phase two study in HCC that's incorporating the standard of care at Tezobev. And we are planning a phase three ex a two expansion of the laryngocostoma cohort as well, incorporating immune checkpoint inhibition. Thanks very much. Just to acknowledge our funders and thanks for your attention. Thank you, Professor Robert, for your excellent presentation. Now we're waiting up for questions or comments uh, from panelists. Uh, may I ask, uh, Robert, firstly, congratulations once again. Every time I hear you, I really enjoy and learn so much more. Thank you. I have a few observations and uh, comments. So when we do the radiation SBRT and we have given the immunotherapy, uh, a fair number of the patients have decompensated and uh, they have shown a rapid rise. Maybe they are more immune stimulated. So uh, instead of giving five uh, SBRT sessions, we now give one or two uh, mm -hmm. because the decompensation, even in uh, child's uh, A or early B, they have gone bad. So this is my first, uh, uh, second question of mutanomics, where you have given uh, uh, a plus B atezolizumab and bevacizumab, and they are not responding. And uh, you have touched it briefly, but uh, this is now becoming common. Uh, so is there a point uh, of any guidance on patients who are not responding to combination? Two questions. Great questions. And I think the first question really speaks to the selection of patients that receive SBRT. And so, and, and again, again, I think it brings us back to that multidisciplinary discussion that we were talking about um, earlier, because I, I think we do have to be um, ex ex extremely cautious about um, SBRT dosing, SBRT planning. 
um, uh, making sure that um, you know, treatment is limited uh, as much as possible to the tumor and, and that there isn't um, a, a likelihood of, 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 um, of decompensation. But I think you're, you're exactly right that that's, that's a, a key part of, of the discussion in terms of tumor selection. And there are patients that we will show to our, our um, regional oncology colleagues and they'll say, no, I think we think we will do, uh, we, will, we will get decompensation with treating this patient. So I think that's definitely one factor. And then, um, and I, I, and I think your point is exactly right. We are just beginning, um, I think, across, you know, um, globally to understand who are the people who are most likely to respond to immune checkpoint therapy. There are few studies that are, are giving us hints that, um, that we can actually identify biomarkers of response. But that, I think, it, it should be a... a one of our global efforts across across regions that we are biopsying patients with intermediate to advanced stage disease who are candidates for immune checkpoint therapy. And as they're receiving checkpoint therapy, we are doing the genomics and other studies so that we can identify the subgroup of individuals that are best responders. And of course, the other therapies we have, you know, the receptor tyrosine kinase and other therapies, there's a subgroup of people that respond to those. And we're still left with a, a good proportion of our patients that don't appear to respond to either. And, and I think that that's where, that's where a lot of the development work needs to happen as well. Thanks. Thank you very much, Professor Lewis. It was great. Uh, really, your talk is excellent. Uh, Actually, uh, you know, uh, for the advanced hepatocellular carcinoma, especially with metastatic uh, SCC, uh, treatment is challenging. Uh, and uh, the first uh, kinase inhibitor, uh, sorafenib, started for the uh, treatment of the hepatocellular carcinoma. Recently, you know, uh, checkpoint inhibitors became very active. And uh, in my opinion and my in practice, uh, we couldn't take very effective uh, result for the serophone. But uh, what is your opinion about that? Do you use still serophonib or do you use uh, combination therapy or do you use just uh, only uh, checkpoint inhibitors? I, th I think it's really an issue of sequencing. And I think um, so. If if patients um, have good um, have good liver function, uh, we will typically in patients who have advanced disease are not are not candidates for local or local regional therapy. We will typically begin with immune checkpoint therapy, and and, and typically with dual in, dual inhibition therapy, so atezolizumab or the stride um, 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 combination. And um, and then we we look for for response, and in those who don't respond, then we typically will go to uh, to other um, treatments. Um, frequently, lenvatinib um, ends up being the second line choice um, in in our discussions with our, our uh, medical oncology colleagues. They're tending to prefer lenvatinib over sorafenib in the second line. I think there's some evidence, at least on the progression-free survival perspective, that um, that there's um, um, better outcomes with lenvatinib. But I think this is where there's actually quite a bit of activity also in in hepatella carcinoma because there are many clinical trials now that are developing with new agents and new targets. So we find that often those patients that are not responsive in the first line are going into clinical trials so that we can try to expand the armamentarium of, of, for benefit for these patients. Professor uh, Lewis, this is... Uh, sorry, sorry, oh. Asbik. So uh, please go ahead. Okay. So uh, Professor Lewis, outstanding talk. Uh, and really learned a lot. My my question is directed more towards the let's say the clinical implementation of all that you have said. And it seems to me that the clinical implementation will require 
either a tissue biopsy or a very expensive blood biomarker, for example. Uh, and the biomarkers that you have shown are all of them are less than 10% positive. So <laughs> how, how do you convince your health economists to get into this sort of fishing expedition? Maybe, 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 maybe that's the wrong word completely, but, but mm -hmm. how do you get, in, get your health economists to become involved in this? Because they are going to be then the crucial decision makers about how where this thing goes in the future. So your comments, please, your thoughts. That's an exceptional question, and I and I think what all we what we are seeing, of course, is we see, unfortunately, that as we are making these developments to some degree, at least in in a temporary in, in for a temporary period of time, we are it seems almost that we are creating more disparities than reducing disparities of care. Um, but I think so. So I I I think about this in in two ways. First of all is that it's really important to recognize that every time we treat a person that isn't going to respond to a drug, to some degree, we are wasting the drug and we are wasting the patient's time and their life. So, so it's really important when we think about personalizing care to think about modeling the fact that if every time we'd put someone on a drug that they are not going to respond to, that, that is, and, and, and that can be a very expensive waste of resources. And, and when, when we think about, for example, dual immune checkpoint inhibitor, inhibitor therapy that is actually you know, very expensive, it's, I think, important that we are able to develop the systems where we can, at low cost, at lower cost, determine who is who is going to, going to benefit from those therapies. So we are not wasting the therapies. The drug companies may be quite happy with us using <laughs> the therapy, but from a patient perspective, not helpful. But the other thing that I think you point to is that it is important for us as scientists ultimately to be looking to transform or be to be transformative in the development of these therapies. And so we are starting out with the tools we have but it's always important that we are looking to a future in which these therapies are substantially less expensive. And so there's a fair bit of work that colleagues and I are doing that are, for example, focused on using viruses. And can we express new antigens using viruses that might be able to be produced at lower cost? We've learned a lot about using RNAs in, in, in the COVID era, for example, as, as for, for producing vaccines. Can we produce anti-cancer vaccines, for example, using RNAs? So I think we definitely need to be thinking about how are we going to bring these therapies to low and middle income countries? And it, it will need transformative biology, but it, it's really, it, a point you're making is really important. And I think particularly in low and middle income countries, we need to have our scientists begin to be thinking about how we, how we bring this to our patients. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, may I ask a question, Professor Lee? Yes, please. Uh, Dr. was here. Yes, uh, excellent presentation. Uh, we are talking much about the immune therapies and CAR T cell therapies, one of the form of immune therapies. And you did mention about that in your presentation. And we know that this has been approved for lymphomas. Uh, what about the hepatocellular carcinoma? Are there any trials, uh, uh, ongoing trials about that? I heard that there was something about glypican against mm -hmm. glypican, CAR T cells. And uh, so what are the results of these trials? Yeah, so we, you know, I think in general, we've recognized that the liquid tumors are much easier to treat um, with CAR T than solid tumors are. And so that's been, that's, I think, it's a fundamental challenge making the transition and from the very effective CAR T treatment we've seen in, in you know, leukemias and lymphomas to, um, to treating solid tumors. I think we're making steady progress. There are, you know, um, CAR Ts now that are being developed including by um, Dr. Mitchell Ho at NCI and other, other groups um, for Glipican 3, for example. A lot of the work that they are doing is in optimizing the design of the CAR-T. 
for uh, so the CAR T can reach the, the the liver cells and and be effective. So I think there is cautious optimism that we will make progress um, against lipican three and other targets potentially. Dr. Hasmik, I think it is nobody has their hands up anymore, and it is coming to closing time. So yes. shall we shall we close? Uh, with your permission yeah i think we have done with this so at the end i thank uh, professor louis and uh, professor saha who have been in a very short notice <laughs> kindly consented to be there and also dr hamid as well as dr hasmik also on personal communication and we request that every month second tuesday we are happening this uh, alka for today is the eighth edition and it will continue definitely. And uh, as Professor Sarin and uh, Professor Omata suggested, we are now expanding the subsection sessions will be on radiation and uh, surgery, as well as basic scientist also. So this session will continue every month, second Tuesday. So we request your blessings and supports to make this Alka a bigger one. So with this, we want to thank everyone, whoever is here and who are online also. And uh, we're going to close the session. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you Bye -bye. Happy to everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Bye bye. Hi, Dr. Sheena. How are you? Dr. Zai. Yokosuka san. Yeah. Dongmeji, nice to meet you. Okay. Oh, okay. actually, it's yeah. my pleasure. Yeah, it's same, my pleasure. Same. Too. See, yeah. Samu and Kade, very nice. And Sina, very nice. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thanks for your continued support. Thank of course, you. everyone. Anytime. Sure. Bye bye. Bye -bye. Have a good new bye -bye. year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.